D&D, &D, and it's become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. Yeah, but it's just your character that does it on the sheet of paper. Not so with a lot of adults, and says there are 28 deaths related to Dungeons and Dragons. We're really talking about intense violence, intense involvement in a very uh, serious form of violence. She felt so strongly that it was responsible for her son's death that she formed a network of concerned people to warn others about the dangerous aspects of the game. With the new season of Stranger Things heavily involving the Satanic Panic, I thought now would be as good a time as ever to discuss what the Satanic Panic was, its events, history, and impacts. The Satanic Panic began when D&D was thought to influence its players to suicide or murder, among many other abhorrent practices too, like cannibalism, demon summoning, witchcraft, and accurate biology, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So the first supposed connection begins with James Dallas Egbert III. In in 1979, 16-year-old child prodigy James Dallas Egbert III disappeared from his room at Michigan State University. Now you have to understand the situation around James. He was 16 at the time, a child prodigy away from home in a new place, and he had fallen into a drug addiction. James was found in the utility tunnels underneath the university, which came to be known as the Steam Tunnel Incident. Private investigator William Deere attributed all this to Dungeons and Dragons. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what was the connection to Dungeons and Dragons? And it was simply that James played Dungeons and Dragons, and he really liked it. Yeah. And because of this, James Egbert did not receive the help and care he desperately needed. I mean, he basically stopped playing the game altogether. James later died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound in 1980. Despite the evidence regarding his mental health problems, Egbert's suicide was thought to be caused by Dungeons and Dragons. And so this is how our little clown show begins. Because later, James' story would be adapted into a movie, Mazes and Monsters, starring Tom Hanks. It's a story roughly based on the events in James' life. What are you doing? I'm going to join the Great Hall. You can't, it's a trap. I have spells. I'm going to fly. You don't have enough points. I am the maze controller. Maze co Maze controller? Yes. And I have absolute authority in this game. JJ, what am I doing here? And despite the obvious being that it's grossly insensitive in the face of the death of a mentally ill child, because James wasn't even 18 yet, the movie did harm D&D as a name, as Mazes and Monsters obviously refers to Dungeons and Dragons. The movie itself portrays the players as prone to psychotic breaks and suicide. Throughout the movie, it is clear that there are moments when characters just lose all touch with reality. And again, there are multiple suicide attempts throughout the movie. So that's where we start. Now let's discuss our second landmark case, which is Irving Lee Pulling II. He was nicknamed Bink by his family. And in 1982, his family, the Pulling family, came home one night and found him dead on the front lawn after he shot himself through the heart. Now reports from the Washington Times says that Bink was struggling with many different personal problems. And classmates back this up. Victoria Rock Charlie, a classmate of Irving Pulling, commented that he had a lot of problems anyway that weren't associated with the game. Basically, all the reports say and all the classmates confirm that Dungeons and Dragons was not the cause of Bink's suicide. It was also thought by other reports that Bink might have been struggling with his own sexuality, which would have been difficult under such a religious household. And getting to that religious household, it is Patricia Pat Pulling, the mother of Bink, who made the connection to Dungeons and Dragons. And that's how the pulling case became known as another Dungeons and Dragons suicide. But now let's start talking about murder, specifically the murder of Leith Von Stein. I'm just going to call him Von Stein. Von Stein was killed by his stepson, Chris Pritchard. The way the incident was reported was that Von Stein and Bonnie, Chris Pritchard's mother, were sleeping peacefully in their beds. Then a masked assailant rushes into the bedroom kills Von Stein, and then beats Bonnie nearly to death. Now you might be asking, well, what was the motive? 
Well, in fact, Von Stein was rich. He had a $2 million fortune, and in today's money, that's roughly about $5 million. Now, Chris Pritchard hated Von Stein and also wanted the money, so he got to kill him along with his friends. Investigators traced the crime back to Pritchard and members from his Dungeons & Dragons group. They traced the crime to Dungeons & Dragons because one of Pritchard's D&D maps had been outfitted to look like his home. However, investigators also learned that over the course of a year that Pritchard had become involved with drugs and alcohol while attending university. However, this information was disregarded. And then once again, this murder was turned into entertainment. Firstly, it was turned into a movie called Blood Games and then a TV show called Honor Thy Mother. So once again, the entertainment industry profited from these tragedies. Debunking claims. There is one clear through line with all of these D&D suicide murder cases though. All the people involved were mentally ill or were dealing with their own demons. They needed help. Like, they needed psychological help. But because these murder-suicides were pinned on Dungeons & Dragons, they did not get that help. Most people just assumed, if you can stop them playing Dungeons & Dragons and take them to church enough, they'll be fine. But as we all know, they were not fine. Now remember William Deere, the private investigator who started connecting the dots between Dungeons & Dragons and suicide? Well, later he admitted that he made a mistake. He actually wrote a book during the height of the satanic panic called The Dungeon Master, where he outlined his new thoughts. And let me just read this verbatim for a second. Deer also acknowledged that James's domineering mother and struggles with his own sexuality had more to do with his problems than his interest in role-playing games. Honestly, it just sucks that this is the start of the satanic panic, that this investigator, who later retracted his statement, was the one who started it all. But you know what the worst part is? No one even cared that William Deere retracted his statement. In fact, the satanic panic only grew after he retracted that statement. But William Deere did care. And while it does nothing now, since he's dead, I think it's important to acknowledge a man coming out and saying he's wrong. And maybe we could use a lot more of that. Patricia Pulling. But all this, it was just the origin story for our main villain, Pat Pulling. Remember Bink, Irving Pulling? Well, if William Deere is the one who struck the match, it was Pat Pulling who threw gasoline onto the fire. Bink's mother sent the satanic panic hurtling into what it would become. After seeing mazes and monsters, hearing about Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm not sure if Pat ever fully understood it, and being a fundamentalist Christian woman living in Virginia, Pulling was convinced it was Dungeons and Dragons that drove Bink to suicide. So what could Patricia Pulling do? Well, of course she had to sue her son's principal because she thought that the principal had put a curse on Bink and that's what drove him to suicide. I'm not joking. And let me repeat that. She attempted to sue the principal because she thought that he put a curse on Bink because he ran a D&D game. Now some backstory. This was part of a community program that the principal ran. They played everything from Monopoly to chess and yes, Dungeons and Dragons. It was just part of the rotation. This was something that this principal did to keep kids out of trouble. Obviously the suit was laughed out of the courtroom, so Pat did the only thing she could think of. Sue the makers of D&D, TSR, for making the game that killed her son. This case was too dismissed. So Pat did the only reasonable thing after that. She sued the publishers of D&D for publishing the game that killed her son. And that case was too dismissed. So now we have three dismissed cases, one against the principal, one against TSR, and one against the publishers. Now you think that Pat might have learned, but this did not dampen Pat Pulling's feelings about D&D. And let me read you a quote by her. Pulling described D&D as a fantasy role-playing game which uses demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, satanic type rituals, gambling, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divination, and other teachings. What? <laughs> I mean, really, Pat, you couldn't get it all in there? I thought you covered basically every ism in the book. Because, look, I understand the witchcraft, Gambling, sure. Cannibalism, I mean, that's a bit rough, but we can get through it. But I draw the line of homosexuality. 
I mean, sure, demon summoning, that's terrible. But it pales in comparison to someone being gay or blaspheming the Lord. Now, from here, Pat Pulling begins to become a private investigator and begins to investigate. Now, you might be asking, Colin, did she get caught trespassing multiple times? Yeah, yeah, she did. Was she arrested? I couldn't find an arrest record, so I'm going to say no. Did she harass a lot of people? What do you think? Yes. Pat Pulling also became an expert in occult activity and was brought in as an expert witness many times to talk about the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons and what it did to Bink. In 1989, she even wrote a book, The Devil's Web, Who is Stalking Your Children for Satan? And I did my civic duty and I read part of the book and it was laughably bad. It contains essentially every stereotype that you're probably thinking in your head and more. And look, no matter what you think, it's just clear that this book is horribly researched if Pat did any research at all. Pat really had no understanding of how the game worked or just chose not to listen to what people were telling her. I unfortunately think that it's the second option. And I truly do get after researching Pat pulling that this was a woman stricken by grief who was trying to wrestle with it, but did not have the right resources to do so, and in the end, did a lot of harm to a lot of people. And we'll talk about how bad Pat Pulling's research is later, because an author essentially did the literary equivalent of a diss track, and it was so epic and so great that it destroyed Pat Pulling's credibility. But we'll talk about that later, so stick around for the rest of the video. But through it all, Pat Pulling still thought about those three dismissed cases. It didn't sit right with her. She knew that this was the beginning of her villain arc, although it kind of already began. And you might be asking, wait a minute, I thought she already had entered her villain arc. No, 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 it's about to get worse. Pat Pulling created an organization called Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons. And some of you are like, wait, that's an acronym for... After her son's death, Pat Pulling thoroughly investigated the game. She felt so strongly that it was responsible for her son's death that she formed a network of concerned people to warn others about the dangerous aspects of the game. Because of her involvement with D&D, Mrs. Pulling is often consulted by police departments. Like, I cannot even describe how cartoonishly evil bad was. They lied harassed and tried to do everything possible to get rid of Dungeons and Dragons. Now I will say for the purposes of academic integrity that Irving Lee Pulling Sr., the husband of Pat Pulling, said that basically Bad did not want to destroy Dungeons and Dragons. He said, quote, She never set out to ban anything. She only wanted to educate parents. But actions speak louder than words, and we have to look at what actually happened. The Chicago Sun-Times in 1987 had this to say about Bad as an organization and their mission goals. They say between the violent nature of the game and the steadily increasing violent behavior of its players is why Bad is doing this. To combat this, Dungeons and Dragons, these well-meaning individuals want the game outright banned. And yeah, that was Bad's mission. They were trying to get the game banned or at least heavily restricted. And really the difference is just how Christian was your area. If you were in the South and heavily Christian, they were trying to get it banned. If you were in a place like California or Massachusetts, they were trying to get it heavily restricted. They knew their audience. Bad launched an extensive campaign that targeted the mainstream Christian audience across America. And Bad's biggest victory was getting on 60 Minutes. I encourage you to watch this entire 60 Minute segment, and I'm going to put the link in the video description because it's just so eye-opening to how things were at the time. It is honestly mind-blowing. I don't think we could honestly conceive of such a thing today. I don't know, maybe recent events. Now here are some of the most important clips from the segment. Dr. Thomas Radecki is a psychiatrist who teaches at the University of Illinois Medical School and who is chairman of the National Coalition on Television Violence. He has been studying the game for several years and says there are 28 deaths related to Dungeons and Dragons in the last five years. It's not coincidence, not when you have careful documentation, you have careful notes, you have eyewitnesses. For instance, one 
case, the parents were actually saw their child summon uh, Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room before he killed himself. Another case, the kid had thought he had the ability to astral travel coming from the D Dungeons and Dragons game, that he could leave his body and come back. And he had rigged it up just according to the rule book so he could do it. He was surrounded by his materials and put a bullet in his head so he could leave his body, and he's never come back. This is make-believe, and nobody's murdered, and there's no violence there. I mean, uh, to, to use an analogy with another game, who is bankrupted by losing a game of Monopoly? Nobody is, because the money is make-believe, the property is make-believe, and the bankruptcy is make-believe. The important thing to remember is, if you're playing a character, let's say, for instance, you have an evil character, the rules tell you your evil character is allowed, in the scope of the rules, to murder people and to rape and plunder. If you're playing a good character, you're the defender of the people. You try to stop the people from raping and plundering. Yeah. But it's just your character that does it on the sheet of paper. When the game is over, the game does not tell you to go out and rape and plunder. Three things about those clips. Number one, that psychiatrist who did the study, yeah, all that data has been disproven. The study counted the same suicides multiple times and basically any mention of Dungeons and Dragons was a strong connection. It's one of those catch-22s. No matter what someone did, it was basically a strong connection to Dungeons & Dragons unless they basically burned their books. Two, I have a problem with the kids that they interviewed because they are very uncomfortable and don't do a great job of explaining themselves. And the entire segment definitely has an anti-Dungeons & Dragons slant. I would have loved to see what those kids actually said instead of just cherry-picking some not great comments. Basically, I think the interview with the players was cut to fit a narrative and really is just latent with a lot of bias. Number three, poor Gary Gygax. At the time, he was a practicing Christian and you can see that he has no idea how people could actually mistake Dungeons and Dragons for satanic worship. I mean, the man is coming right out and saying it. He's saying it's make-believe. It's like Monopoly or any other game. It's just fun. And you all have to understand at this point that the anti-Dungeons and Dragons crowd was not reasonable. They weren't acting rationally. Stranger Things Season 4 actually does a good job showing how the movement was driven by emotional fervor, ignorance, and a desire to return to a social purity that never existed. And I'd love to say that these efforts were unsuccessful, but as we all know, they were incredibly successful at swaying public opinion. Panic at the Satanic. Let's document some other notable events that happened during the Satanic Panic. Firstly, BAD was so successful, they almost got the government involved. The Federal Trade Commission actually looked into Dungeons & Dragons and considered restricting or outright banning the game due to multiple self-appointed consumer watchdogs going after the game. Additionally, Christian sects all across America began to denounce Dungeons & Dragons. In 1985, Reverend John Quinley of the Lakeview Full Gospel Fellowship had this to say about Dungeons & Dragons. The game is an occult tool that opens up young people to influence or possession by demons. Now unfortunately, Reverend John was an important figure in stirring up the panic during this time. His sermons, interviews, and articles spread like wildfire across the nation. Quigley's teaching spread from his home church in Georgia and influenced other congregations as far north as Vermont, as far south as Texas, and as far west as California. The point is, churches across America attacked the game and its players. Again, look to Stranger Things Season 4 because that whole situation... That happened once or twice. And during this time, the media continued to paint a very different picture of the game. Let's look at the most famous example of anti-D&D media in the Satanic Panic, Dark Dungeons. Dark Dungeons is a story about Debbie, and she gets involved in a D&D group, and then things go, quickly, off the rails. The dungeon master, Miss Frost, has Debbie begin occult rituals. Then, Debbie starts to get dark powers and even mind controls her parents into buying her more D&D figures. Yeah, that happens in the story. However, one of Debbie's friends, Marcy, kills herself because she died in the game. This is a common thing in the Satanic Panic where a lot of people who didn't know the game thought that if you died in the game, that players would kill themselves in real life. Now, after learning of Marcy's death, Miss Frost goes full evil and basically tells Debbie to forget Marcy because she was weak. And Debbie does the only thing that she can do. 
Debbie goes to a priest and learns that all this is devil stuff and wrong. The story ends when Debbie burns all her books and the reader gets a neat little card to fill out. And I just love the blatant allusions to so much history revolving book burning. Like, yeah, you don't like the game, but really you're gonna go and burn the books? I mean, they didn't actually burn the- oh wait, yes, they did actually burn the D&D books. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what you think. And from here, we're moving on to the real mainstream media, and we have to talk about one thing. Ratings. Because you have to understand, a moral panic is great for ratings, so any chance that they could get, they would milk the satanic panic because people would tune in to watch. And while there are too many stories to talk about, let's talk about the most impactful one. Satanic Cults and Children, which aired November 19th, 1987 during the heart of the Satanic Panic. Basically, Geraldo Rivera dug into Satanic cults and partially connected it to Dungeons and & Dragons. And this is such a big deal because, and I quote, his programs probably have the greatest influence over public opinion. Geraldo was a professional reporter, so people took him at his word. And boy oh boy was his word a lot. He stated, Estimates are that there are over one million Satanists in this country. The majority of them are linked in a highly organized, very secretive network. From small towns to large cities, they have attracted police and FBI attention to their satanic ritual, child abuse, child pornography, and grisly satanic rituals. The odds are that this is happening in your town. Obviously, those numbers weren't even close to right. But with numbers being that high and the threat seeming imminent, the panic skyrocketed. And now we have to give Geraldo Rivera his due. Since this segment aired, Geraldo has retracted his statements. He has also apologized for the damage he caused to innocent people. And I think we have to acknowledge that many people have come out since the panic and have retracted their statements. Geraldo was one of the first and ought to be commended for doing so. All right, let's play a little game now. I'm going to give you a few quotes and you write in the comments which one you think is false. No cheating, please. All right, first quote. We aren't sure at this point whether we have a double suicide or a suicide homicide. Dungeons and Dragons appeals to very intelligent people who use their imagination to manipulate characters and work through a series of mazes to achieve treasures and avoid falling into the dungeon. My understanding is that once you reach a certain point where you are the master, your only way out is death. That way, no one can beat you. Crazy quote. Let's get to number two. Dungeons and Dragons is a game created by the Satanic. It is the path to witchcraft and sadism. There are more than 600 fully-fledged practicing witches in mid Wollamonte Valley, and we don't need any more. Oh geez, 600 witches? Is that true? Who knows? Let's get to the third quote. Now this quote's a bit longer. Wouldn't fear for my mortal soul, dear editor. This has been an interesting week. Sunday night I tuned into the tail end of 60 Minutes and was confronted with some lady in a big flap about the game Dungeons & Dragons. I never did get her point, whether she wanted the game taken off the market or just wanted to publicly air her sorrow over the suicide of her son, which she blames on D&D. I commiserate. Losing a teen or a preteen child to suicide must be the most agonizing thing a parent can face. The rest I took with a grain of salt. My younger son has played D&D since the third grade, and it has never occurred to me to check him for suicidal tendencies. In eight years he has been playing, I spent close to $600 on books, modules, dice, lead figures, and other accountermints of the game. I guarantee you, when I spend that kind of money, I pay attention to what it's all about. I've listened to many an hour of it. I don't exactly see what they get out of it. It seems rather boring to me, but I've had games continue on the kitchen table for days and fail to see the harm in it. Two days later, I hear on the radio that ACDC cannot appear at Prairie Capital Convention Center because the local clergy and a few concerned parents think that their music promotes Satanism. Amazing! Now I suppose I'll have to keep watch on my cats and neighbor's dogs in case my sons decide to indulge in some of the more gory rites of Satanic sacrifices. After all, we have and play every ACDC album that's been cut. I secretly want to go to the concert myself, but really couldn't because, first, I'd embarrass my kids to death, and second, my eardrums can't take the decibel level they could when I was 16. But if I did decide to go, I surely wouldn't do so in fear of my mortal soul or my son's. If people don't want their kids to go, keep them home. 
or if they don't want them playing D&D, don't buy the game. What has that got to do with the rest of us? I think all this brouhaha is ridiculous. A very reasonable person speaking in defense of Dungeons & Dragons. Is it real? Maybe. Alright, number four. Dungeons & Dragons is essentially a worship of violence. It's a very intense war game. Talk to people who have played it. It's fascinating. It's a f game of fun. But when you have fun with murder, that's dangerous. When you make a game out of war, that's harmful. The game is full of human sacrifice, eating babies, drinking blood, rape, murder of every variety, curses of insanity. It's just a very violent game. All right, one last quote about a corrupted D&D player named Abby from a local paper. Not only have they perverted our kids' minds, they have corrupted responsible adults. Even dear Abby had the gall to question one of our members who teaches that women have one more rib than men. Read Genesis. In our own backyard, the staff of Kalapoya Middle School practices witchcraft. They allow kids to play Dungeons and Dragons. Did you know that there are over 600 practicing witches in the area? Some of them, may the Lord forgive me, even believe the earth is more than a few thousand years old. Man, this place with so many practicing witches, crazy. And also, poor sweet Abby who actually has her biology right because women don't actually have one more rib than men and the earth is more than a few thousand years old. Now, by this point, I'm sure you can guess that that is a real quote, but what about the others? All right, write your answer in the comments below. Done? Well, it was two, the second quote, about the other 600 witches. And it was based off of the teachings of Reverend John Quigley. Remember him? His teachings got spread far and wide. And he actually did think that there were more than 600 witches around him performing their dark magic. Basically, the information was accurate. The quote just was not exact. The fourth quote has an interesting backstory as well, because... That is from a practicing psychiatrist and the chairman of the National Coalition of Television Violence in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Now you might be thinking, how can someone in that position possibly say that quote? Well, because they just didn't check or check well. Because you see, the people in power rode the wave of panic and false reports. False reports that were mostly written by, you guessed it, bad and pat pulling i told you pat pulling was the villain of our story it all comes back to bad they kept pushing their rhetoric throughout the entire movement pat pulling and her people put out so much false information that as i was reviewing official documents i could literally just see their stink their telltale like just buzzwords all over the document but there was hope Remember that third quote? Well, it represented a growing counter-movement to the fundamentalist panic. Because look, once things like rock and roll, teachers, and other fantasy books began to be targeted, people started to wake up and go, wait a minute, this is wrong. I don't understand these other things, but I understand this that is close to me. And as the web began to grow wider, people started to understand that it was bullshit. And now we finally get to the literary diss track that ended Pat Pulling's reign of terror. Kind of. The Pulling Report. Eventually, author Michael Stackpole had enough. He was a fantasy author with a platform and the means to stand up to pulling. In 1990, Stackpole published The Pulling Report, in which he documented numerous errors made by Bad and accused Pulling of misrepresenting her credentials as an expert witness on games. And look, I can't go into the full report because it's just so long, but it is wonderful. It's a systematic takedown of everything wrong with Pat Pulling's information. I highly suggest you guys read the Pulling Report, and maybe I'll do a video on it if you guys want me to. And again, the Pulling Report is a beast. It absolutely shattered Pat Pulling's credibility. This combined with another article written by Stackpool, Game Hysteria and the Truth, recontextualized for many people in higher positions of authority what bad really was, and that it was bad. So Pulling's authority began to collapse after that, and in addition, her health started to fail her. Pulling eventually succumbed to cancer, 
and by the year 2000, FAD had essentially dissolved. And the report's impact can still be felt today despite the fall of BAD. It is routinely cited in articles and arguments to defend D&D &D and tabletop RPGs to this very day. Michael Stackpool gave the D&D &D community the shield to defend ourselves. So. Thanks, Mr. Stackpool. You're such a cool guy. And honestly, I hope this video reaches you because you have done so much for the D&D &D community, and I just want to say thank you. And also, if you could correct anything that was wrong in this video, because you know so much more about pulling and all that stuff than me, but we just need to thank him. And from Stackpool, the tide began to turn. From about 2000 on, we started to get actual academic studies about the connection between D&D &D and mental health. D&D &D and mental health. All right, a lot to go over here. Studies by the American Association of Suicidology, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and Health and Welfare Canada all found no causal link between D&D &D and suicide. Yeah, pretty crazy, right? But the studies kept on coming. Check out this one from 2015. The psychological understanding regarding Dungeons & Dragons has completely changed. In fact, in a study titled Psychiatrist Perceptions of Role-Playing Games, psychiatrists do not associate role-playing games such as Dungeons & Dragons with poor mental health. But now it's time for the coup de grace, the most damning piece of evidence. Because I'd like to remind you how all this started the supposed connection between Dungeons and & Dragons and suicide. The American Association of Suicidology and the Centers for Disease Control and the National Safety Council, among others, investigated the levels of suicide amongst RPG players in relation to national statistics on youth suicide in Canada and the United States. It found that while overall level of youth suicide was 5,300 per year, there had only been 128 suicide attempts by game players recorded by BAD and affiliate organizations between 1979 and 1988. Furthermore, most of these acclaimed suicides were simply accumulated from unsourced newspaper clippings, often referring to the same incident several times over. According to the estimated number of RPG gamers in the country at that time, there should have been at least 1,060 gamer suicides in the same period. Consequently, the finding of the report was that suicide amongst RPG gamers was actually significantly lower than the national averages for the age demographic of 15 to 25 year olds. Yeah, folks, that's an 88% decrease in suicides for people who are playing Dungeons and Dragons. A decrease. But you know what boils my blood the most? We fucking knew it in 1987! Here's a report from that year. Studies have shown that depression and suicidal tendencies are not typically associated with role players. Feelings of alienation are not associated with mainstream players. According to one study, there is no significant correlation between years of playing the game and emotional stability. They buried the reports. They knew there was no connection to D&D and suicide in 1987. They hid it though. They hid everything. Because Let's be honest here, people didn't care about these kids. They didn't care about the people committing suicide or getting them the help that they so desperately needed. And that's what enrages me the most, that this information was actually there, but it only started coming to light and people started only acknowledging the academic studies, acknowledging William Deere decades after the fact. No one cared about the truth in the satanic panic and people got hurt because of it. And I think that's what's most damning. Speculations. Now we're gonna start getting into some speculations on my part about why the satanic panic happened. So take everything here with a grain of salt. Here is a chart. What does this chart describe? This chart, and many like it, show that since World War II, religion has been declining in the United States. That's nothing new. But then, in the 1980s, it starts to hold flat. It starts to stop. And the peaks and valleys, they correlate to the peaks and valleys of the satanic panic when these big incidents happened. Preachers and other people, like Pat Pulling, who spoke out against Satanism and connected it to Dungeons and Dragons, got recognition. The pastors, they grew their congregations. The media, they got more views. And parents didn't have to face the fact that something in their child's life drove them to suicide. And instead, they blamed a game. And you know why these people did this? 
because it was easier than just being decent human beings. People profited off the suicides of these people. They profited off of the fear-mongering as well. And they profited off taking something away that people held dear. Now, the LGBTQ plus is a large portion now of the D&D community, and it always has been. While the connection to James Egbert is clear that he probably was part of the LGBTQ plus community, my research shows that it's likely that many others were too who fit these descriptions. They were as you know, living in a different time, growing up around people who, in general, they didn't feel would accept them. D&D, for these kids and young adults, was an escape. And again, take this with a grain of salt because I don't have statistics or data or accounts to back this up, but just through my own intuition and gut feeling from going over the evidence, I think that these people used D&D as a true escape. It was a place and a game where they could be themselves. And whether they were LGBTQ, trans, autistic, or what have you, D&D was their escape. And when it was targeted, they felt trapped. Like, there was no way out. They couldn't escape anymore. So these people took the one way out that they could fathom. Suicide. So here is the suicide hotline, and know that you're never alone in this community. Damn it. Um, I'm gonna go play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends, and I hope you can too. And thank all of you for entering the dungeon. See ya.